my work in political sociology is uh, in many ways very different. Um, it's, uh, it's almost like detective work. What we do in this research in social science terms is to construct networks, networks of people and institutions. And we trace those networks from a social class into policy groups and corporations and then into government. Uh, to construct these networks um, is uh, one of these tasks where it's catch as catch can. Sometimes you're using the library. Sometimes you have to go out and interview. Sometimes uh, you have to go out and observe. Um, so we use a whole variety of, of different methods. It's just, in a way, very different from my research in, in dreams where, where it's pretty quantitative, pretty controlled, uh, we're worried about reliability and validity. In this other kind of research, you're out there trying to see what you can learn uh, about networks of people and institutions. And a lot of it, in a certain way, is invisible. That is, it doesn't have a big sign on it that this is the network through which flows foreign policy. But yet, in my research, I'm able to show by tracing people's careers, uh, for instance, the people that are appointed to the State Department, these are invariably people who have uh, gone to certain uh, schools, uh, Ivy League schools, who have then gone to work for a big corporation or a corporate law firm or a foundation like the Ford Foundation. And they've worked their way up, but at a certain point they're asked to join policy discussion groups like the Council on Foreign Relations or the Foreign Policy Association where they get to know other people interested in these topics. and. Lo and behold, that's where the personnel that goes into government uh, in foreign policy comes from. That, uh, that they that they have they have been seen by the the um, the older generation at these organizations. And if anything, it was even more dramatic, say, for the Clinton administration, for this Democratic administration, where five or six uh, of his top appointments were people who were trustees of this organization, not just members, but trustees on the 22 or 24 member board of trustees of the Council on Foreign Relations. Clinton tapped four or five of those people into his government. Well, that's a network of people and institutions. And if we look at this Council on Foreign Relations a little closer, we say, well, huh, what's it about? Well, we say that we see they get that money from certain foundations and from certain major corporations. Uh, we see that they hold these small discussion groups where academic experts come in and essentially hold discussions that sophisticate these various uh, businessmen and corporate lawyers. So they do know their stuff when they go to government because they've been in the, in the discussion group that meets once a week or once a month on China or on the Soviet Union when it existed or, or on Central America. So we see, wow, they have a, they have a role in uh, uh, creating an understanding of the system. Uh, in a business person who you know, spends most of his or her day trying to, to make money in a you know, very narrow business, like you know, manufacturing paper or computer chip. But once a week they go and they rub elbows with people that are talking about um, um, uh, these more general matters. And I often use my own work on dreams, which I just talked about, to give, to give an example of this. I could go into a group of business people who have never had a clue about dreams. And in the space of three hours, with a few charts and uh, with a discussion, I could make them very sophisticated about what's happening in the world of dreams. They could walk out of there sophisticated. Now, but the point is most people, most ordinary people, can't command some expert to come and tell them. And, and can they find the three hours in the day, you know, they can just take off? Can they find the site? But the Council on Foreign Relations, in effect, creates a site where they bring the finest expert on a certain country, somebody, say, f uh, from Santa Cruz, who's the finest expert there is, like Bruce Larkin on China. Bruce could go there and tell them a very great deal about what's happening. Um, or Christine Wong could tell them what's happening in the, in the, in the um, economy of China, how it's changing, and what the opportunities are for a business person in China. They never have to know one thing about China until they got there. Now, they don't just bring Christine and Bruce. They bring somebody else that maybe has a little different perspective. And maybe there's an argument between a, a liberal and a conservative. And now I get to see uh, the different points of view. And which do I think makes most sense on this issue, the liberal or the conservative? Furthermore, I sit there and I watch these two academics argue. 
and I say, well, you know, that guy's more liberal than I am, but he and I seem to get along. We, we have a chemistry. So when I get appointed to government, I'm going to take him along because I can talk to him and I trust him, and he's going to tell me the liberal side. And I'm going to put that in there next to my usually conservative view, and then I'm going to really make a good decision. So they not only get sophisticated at these organizations, but they also get to look over the experts that they're going to take to government with them. And that's then how uh, uh, experts come to be in our government. Well, I've talked about my research in a very methodological way, but what I've just said leads into the larger theory. It's my theory uh, that I think I can back with my research that the owners and managers of large corporations in the United States dominate the economic and, and political realms. That they are the people that make the decisions basically in their self-interest that, uh, that run the United States of America. Uh, that's why the wealth distribution and income distributions are, are so skewed. That's why we have the tax structure we do. That's why we have uh, welfare, for instance, instead of workfare. Meaning by that, that conservatives like welfare. That may sound like a shock to you, but it, it conservatives that want welfare because they don't want the government hiring uh, unemployed workers because that will uh, tighten up labor markets and make people's salaries go up. So they'd much rather do welfare than, than, uh, than uh, workfare. And then, of course, they get to badmouth these people besides and say, well, you're only on the dole and so on. So these people shape the country, I think, uh, in uh, their own interest to make it so that you can make the most money possible. Well, some of my critics will say things like, well, what about all those experts in government? Aren't those professors all independent experts? What about Ken Henry Kissinger? He made, was a very important policy maker. And he's just a professor of government. Furthermore, he was an immigrant to the United States. How does that fit with the idea that the elite dominates the United States? And then I tell them the story I've just told you. I say, look, Henry Kissinger was a professor at Harvard, yes. But his boss was an upper-class guy named um, George McMundy, who was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. And he said to his friends down at the council, hey, you know, if you need somebody that's really good on uh, nuclear weapons policy for that new discussion group, you ought to get Henry Kissinger down there. He's all right. So he was one of these experts. Sitting at the table for those discussions was a man named Nelson Rockefeller, who needs no introduction in terms of his name Rockefeller, but he, for the younger generations, he was one of five Rockefeller brothers that rose eventually to be the uh, governor of, of uh, New York, tried to be president, failed, ended up uh, a vice president under uh, Ford after the uh, Nixon uh, resignation in the face of of uh, impeachment over Watergate. At any rate, in the middle 50s, Nelson Rockefeller meets Kissinger at the Council on Foreign Relations and hires Kissinger as his aide. Ever after, Kissinger is a hired employee, an advisor to uh, Nelson Rockefeller. So Kissinger, if he was just any old professor at any old place, he wouldn't be where he came to be. Uh, in fact, he met the power elite, partly at Harvard, but also at a Council on Foreign Relations, and, it, and, and became part of it. So the idea that experts contradict my theory, that uh, the elite few, the wealthy few, dominate America, I think is just totally wrong. And I've shown through these network analyses and showing what happens at these organizations why it's, it's totally wrong. Now, then people say, well, what about all these politicians? I mean, they are middle class people, and, and uh, they don't seem to be all millionaires, although a lot of them are. Uh, what about that? And then I explain to them about campaign finance and how the political parties work. Uh, and we have done an enormous amount of work tracing out who gives to whom and why and what and how important that money is. So a major politician does not go very far in the United States without backing from some wealthy group. Uh, that's just the, the, the long and the short of it. Now then, from there, there's fascinating n nuances. There are different religious groups that back different uh, uh, politicians. In the North, um, there are people who are wealthy, uh, Catholics and Jews, who are excluded by the predominantly Protestant rich, who won't even let these people in their social clubs. And people have to develop parallel social clubs. Well, they recognize this snub. They are aware acutely aware of the discrimination that's practiced by WASPs towards, towards them. You know, in our day and age, everybody thinks all the white people are discriminating against all the people of color, and they overlook 
the history of discrimination in this United States, which has been uh, in good part, by no means all, and not the worst discrimination. I recognize racism towards blacks. Uh, slavery has been the, the horrendous thing of the country. But it just so happens that uh, a white person who's Jewish or Catholic who becomes rich uh, is not taken into uh, these circles, uh, the higher circles, at least wasn't in the past, and only gradually is this day. Those people tend to support Democrats, and so there are a little difference between who supports Democrats and Republicans. Furthermore, the Southerners, until very recently, had different interests than the Northern rich. The Southern rich, plantation elites, based on a low-wage economy of totally oppressing and suppressing blacks, um, they were Democrats. That was their party. The party, the Democratic Party, which is often used as a criticism of me, they say, well, how can you say the, the rich rule America when there's the Democratic Party, which is clearly a party of liberal and labor people and the common person? And I say, no, it's the party of the Southern rich. It uh, started that way and it was that way into the 60s and still in a way lingers that way when you look at people like Sam Nunn of Georgia, uh, who's a conservative and very important. Now, in the future, we're going to see all the conservatives, all the business people of America, except uh, those who are in some way mistreated by their rich friends. We're going to see all the business people of America in the Republican Party. That's been the trend since the Voting Rights Act of 1965. That is, since blacks got the right to vote, the Democratic Party has become um, less useful to the uh, Southerners because it was the party that through the Democrats, they were able to exclude blacks in the South from voting, that is, exclude them from power. When you can exclude people from power, you can economically exploit them. This business about civil rights in the South, from a power point of view, it's not about civil rights, it's about controlling a labor force. And if the uh, African Americans in the South had had any uh, civil rights, then they would have uh, been able to vote and uh, go to court and do these various things that would make it so you could not uh, exploit them in a low, way, low wage way that, um, that they were exploited uh, up until uh, uh, the 60s. So when you explain to people about how this country works, that, that, that uh, because we have a presidential single member district system that there is no way to start a third party without injuring your friends. That is, if you start a liberal party, you're going to elect conservatives or vice versa. If the right wing Republicans started their own party, which they never have, you notice they're too sm smart to do that, then th but that would lead to the election of liberals all uh, over the place. Even the reason Clinton got in was in good part because Perot grabbed off so many of those Republican votes uh, and they're all going to go back to the Republican side. It looks like here as we speak here in the um, late fall, early winter of, of 1994. But my point then is that you're stuck with a two-party system and if one of those parties is dominated by uh, plantation elites of the South, Southern white rich, then there was never any place for liberal and, and labor uh, uh, forces to go in the United States and that's why uh, the rich are even more powerful in the United States than they are in other countries. We don't have a labor party, we don't have a, a liberal party, we don't have a social democratic party, we don't have anything like the welfare state in terms of health insurances and unemployment insurances and so on that uh, these other countries have. We have a, a country that's completely anti-government because that's a, the ideology of business people and they're afraid of government because it might help labor. Uh, the one goal of the number one goal of all business people is to control labor markets. That is that they can get workers at the price they want to get them at and in plenty of numbers. Uh, labor would like to limit the number of workers and raise then thereby wa raise the uh, wage. And they and the only way they can do that is with the help of government. That's really clear. Um, and so that makes businessmen anti-government. So I, my research, uh, I think, demonstrates all that uh, to the max. But in any case, we have traced out all of the clubs and schools and resorts and retreats of the, of the rich to show that they are a cohesive social group. We've done all that kind of research. Then we did a lot of research to show that these people are involved in the corporations and show how they dominate the uh, boards of directors of these corporations. Then we show what I talked about at the start, namely how all those people are involved in these various policy groups like the Council on Foreign Relations, but there are others, the Business Roundtable, the uh, um, Committee for Economic Development, uh, there's quite a few of these. And then we connect it to government. We show they're appointed to government. We show they dominate 
campaign finance. We show this is true for the Democratic Party. I trace it back into history. Uh, I compare it with other countries, and I end up with the kind of analysis that, uh, that I just um, put forward uh, here a minute ago.